Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Mary's Episcopal Church here in Richmond, Virginia. Welcome to our St. Mary's family here and to our broader family um, who join us online. God bless you all. Um, today is the third Sunday in Lent, March the 7th, and I have just a couple of quick announcements. I want to start first, speaking of Lent, um, by just continuing to say thank you for everyone who contributed to uh, the daily devotional that many of us are using in this season of Lent um, with dozens of reflections done by parishioners. If you do not have one, it is never too late. And you can go to our website and click um, and you'll get a PDF version of this or you can just um, call the church office and run by and we'll be glad to give you one. Thank you for the continuing ministry of our um, fellowship committee um, who keep feeding us, I think twice in this past month. It's a real pick me up and a happy thing for all of us. Thank you to Temple Cabell, who was our chef this past week and fed 120 or so folks. Um, I also wanna say thank you for everyone who joined us for the annual parish meeting uh, I think when everything was all said and done, we had about 125 households join us, um, which is around 200 people, and I'm just so grateful um, for the support that you showed for that meeting. Um, and finally, I just want to draw your attention to um, a wonderful young person in our parish, Margaret Weinstein. Um, you, you can find a... Um, an article in last week's Annunciation. Um, Margaret has um, organized a, uh, a food drive to benefit Goochland Cares, and you can find out how you can be supportive of this good work that Margaret's doing in that article. And I encourage you to either um, bring food by to the church, and you can find a list of things that are most needed, or you can make out a check to St. Mary's Episcopal Church and put Goochland Cares in the memo line and we will make sure that it gets to Goochland Cares. Thank you, Margaret, for your good work. God bless you, everyone.
Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from the all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the inequity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord, your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath, Sabbath day, and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male, or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, 
and their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into our lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The commandment of the Lord gives light to the eyes. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold. Sweeter far than honey, than honey in the cold. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The commandment of the Lord gives light to the eyes. from the Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. So, said one of the members on the Commission of Ministry, tell me about your favorite story of Jesus. Well, as innocent as that question sounded, my answer was going to determine whether or not I would continue as a postulant in the ordination process, or whether it would end right then and there. The members of that commission were literally the gatekeepers to the next chapter in my life, so no pressure whatsoever. I should have given my answer more thought, but I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. I don't know why I didn't talk about Jesus with the little children or Jesus visiting the home of Martha and Mary. I could have chosen one of his many healing miracles to talk about or one of his most famous parables, such as the prodigal son or the good Samaritan, but I didn't. What did come to mind was the story of Jesus in the temple overturning the money tables and chasing out the money changers with a whip. It's this morning's gospel reading, and you could have heard a pin drop after I said that was one of my favorite stories about Jesus. Finally, someone was quick-witted enough to say, why that story? And I said that it had always, I had always remembered it because it was so uncharacteristic of Jesus to be so angry. Then I said it made Jesus seem more human to me than some of the other stories. Then came the follow-up question. Do you have anger issues? If I didn't before, I did then. No one had ever asked me that question, and I didn't think it was a fair question. I suddenly felt the full weight of the authority of that committee or commission to decide my future. So with a good amount of righteous indignation, I answered that I certainly did not have anger issues. Well, that was almost 20 years ago now, and this is the first chance that I've had to revisit that story of Jesus and the money changers. The reason Jesus was in the temple in the first place was that Passover was approaching. The time when Jews remember and celebrate God's intervention in leading them out of slavery in Egypt into freedom. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this story is placed at the end of Jesus' public ministry and before his arrest. In John's story, it's placed at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and oddly enough, right after his first miracle or sign at a wedding in Cana. Maybe John's placement of this story had something to do with what he wanted us to know early on in his gospel about Jesus. Scholars believe that John's gospel was the last to be written and maybe some 60 to 70 years after Jesus had died. So that meant that John had plenty of time to develop an understanding of who Jesus was. And I think some of the clues about that are found in this morning's story. The first clue is found in Jesus' anger in the temple, his act of anger. It was similar to what Old Testament prophets did to shock the Israelites into changing their behavior, their idolatrous and unfaithful behavior, before it angered God. So maybe it was important for John that we think of Jesus as a prophet. 
John also believed that Jesus was the Son of God. And we know that in the way Jesus referred to the temple as his father's house. The temple had always been a sacred place to the Jews, a thin place between heaven and earth where God's presence could be felt and known. The temple had been destroyed and rebuilt several times during history. When Jesus said that should the temple be destroyed again, that it would only take three days to rebuild it, the temple leaders were stunned and no, had no idea what he meant. They were thinking literally in terms of bricks and mortar. But Jesus was thinking that he himself would become that thin place through which God's nature would be revealed. He believed himself to be the living temple. In the three days that it would take for the temple to be rebuilt was the length of time between Jesus' death and his resurrection. It was the time when Jesus would become the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. It was important to John that we also know that about Jesus. So Jesus was a prophet. He was the Son of God. And he was the Messiah. And the more Jesus acted like either of those, or referred to himself as any of those, the more angry the temple leaders became, and the more they challenged his authority. Besides being the place that connected God with his creation, the temple was also a place where Jews could come and have their sins forgiven through burnt offerings of animals, or birds. Those offerings had to be unblemished, and few of them arrived at the temple in that condition. Fortunately, the temple had its own stock of unblemished animals, which the weary travelers could purchase. Unfortunately, those same travelers probably carried Roman coins in their pockets and those coins were forbidden to be used in the temple. Thus, the reason for money changers in the first place, they were happy to convert that currency into treasury coins for a fee. When Jesus shouted at the money changers to stop making his father's house a marketplace, he was acting out of the belief that there would be no more need for any burnt offerings, nor would there be any more need for priestly intervention. Jesus would become the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of all people. No wonder the temple leaders became indignant. And the more I think about their reaction, the more I believe that being indignant is a sure sign that something is broken. Something needs fixing. The temple system was working way too well, though, and those in authority were benefiting from it and were too close to see what needed fixing. But Jesus saw it. I'm not so sure that the Commission on Ministry didn't see something in me that needed fixing. I think they probably sensed my lack of awareness and how anger was a part of my personality, and they challenged me on it. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that was a fair question. Lent is such a perfect time to think about those parts of us that are broken that we work so hard to keep hidden, especially from ourselves. Those parts that arouse our indignation when challenged, and that most of all need to be healed. 
There's no part of us, however, that can ever be hidden from God, no matter how hard we try. Jesus certainly knew that, which always allowed him to be completely himself, without any barriers, filters, or disguises. And as John would agree, it was the only way that God's nature could be revealed to us. Our own worldview and time-honored beliefs we've grown up with unfortunately distort what we see about God. The Apostle Paul knew that when he wrote that the best we can ever do is see through a glass darkly. Jesus, however, is our corrective lens for that, not only in helping us to see who God is, but presenting us unblemished, untarnished before our Creator. It's a gift that so many of us feel like we don't deserve. And we especially feel that way during Lent. But it's there nonetheless. And the only way we can begin to be healed by this gift is in gratefully and gracefully receiving it. Amen.
Let us affirm our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Today, as we gather in our Father's house, let us earnestly pray to God, whose steadfast love embraces all generations. For God's temple throughout the world, and for the holy people who gather in the name of Christ, Lord, have mercy. For our young people, who will be preparing for confirmation, Lord, have mercy. For all nations, peoples, tribes, clans, and families, Lord, have mercy. For the victims of greed, violence, and slavery, and for all who are in need, Lord, have mercy. For those who are dying and for those who have died, especially remembering Pam Howe, Lord, have mercy. For our city and community, and for all those we love, Lord, have mercy. In our outreach cycle of prayer, we pray for the work of Gateway, Gateway Homes, for their staff, volunteers, and health care providers who work to bring new health opportunities for those suffering from mental health issues in our city. Lord, have mercy. Remembering Mary, the mother of our Lord, and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To you, O Lord. Blessed are you, God of power and wisdom, who gave us Christ crucified, Christ raised from the dead, Receive the prayers we offer this day for us in our weakness and for all peoples everywhere. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. These are all our prayers we offer as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.